the thinking was that it was kind of like a big like a big bathtub of water and that if my neighbor's wells go down, well, then mine must go down. And what we're learning, that's not necessarily the case, that our individual impact on particularly if you have a reasonable enough land mass or, or think in terms of large recharge fields or large well fields, that we can have impacts by changing our operation and trying to maximize the water going into the soil. This episode is the conversation between Kara Kroger, a sustainable agriculture specialist with INCAT's Southwest Regional Office in San Antonio, Texas, and Dr. Chris Grodeget from Hereford, Texas. Chris is a local veterinarian, farmer, and stockman, and he's a cutting-edge producer of organic crops and livestock. He talks to Kara about ways he's found to do more dryland farming, using as little water as possible to sustain his fields, by converting the farm back to native grasslands that support cattle. Let's listen. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kara Kroger, and I'm a sustainable ag specialist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology, and I'm located in San Antonio, Texas, in our southwestern office. So today we're going to be speaking with Dr. Chris Grodeget. He's from a town called Hereford, Texas, located in the Texas Panhandle. Thank you, Chris, for joining us today. Thank you, Kara, for having me today. Yes, well, I know you have a lot of good stuff to share, and uh, we are excited to hear it. And I wanted to start out with a little intro today before we get started. Um, there's a, a lot to what we're going to be talking about, so I thought an intro might be good in this case to um, give some context. So uh, Hartford, Texas has a really rich agricultural history, and it has always been fueled by the waters of the Ogallala Aquifer. And unfortunately, that aquifer has been in perilous decline over the past 100 years because more and more land is being plowed for row cropping and to um, host cattle feedlots. So this decline is a serious threat to the longevity of many producers, including Chris, uh, in the Texas Panhandle. And uh, unfortunately, the Texas Panhandle is not the only region staring down the aquifer's decline. Um, this aquifer, 174,000 square mile underground reservoir, and it spans eight landlocked states in the Great Plains from South Dakota to Texas. And along with being a critical resource of drinking water, uh, the aquifer also supports one-fifth of all wheat, corn, cotton, and cattle in the United States. So that's a really large amount of agriculture that it is supporting. So um, each of these products are requiring a lot of uh, irrigation technology and water and have rapidly been draining the aquifer. So if the aquifer, aquifer were to become fully drained, it would take an estimated 6,000 years for it to refill, and that's no time. that We, we don't have that time, right? So uh, unfortunately, though, those waters are still being used to support agriculture at an unsustainable rate, and this has led farmers like Chris to ask, can it be held steady or will it just go down and will they have to move a whole civilization that's in that area? So um, the recharge of this aquifer is, is really difficult for a number of reasons. Um, it, it's in an area of Texas that only receives about 22 inches of rain per year, and there's less surface water in this, any, in this uh, area than anywhere else in the U.S. So also the Ogallala aquifer is recharged through these really – uh, delicate, flat-floored, undrained desert basins that are called playas, and they become at times like a shallow lake when it rains. So these clay basins infiltrate water very, very slowly to refill the aquifer below, and when it rains, water flows downhill to the playas, and it's absorbed. And it, it's possible to capture in soil and in the aquifer if these playas are working properly, but many of them are not working properly or have been um, actually um, – you know, uh, manipulated uh, and just don't function in the same in the same way that they used to. So uh, the other really important thing to note about these playas is that they are an incredible habitat for lots of wildlife, and they're essential to many birds because they sit directly in the central flyway of migration of the migration path in North America. So there's times when these playas just become filled with ducks and geese and all these beautiful birds. Um, so they're they're the need for them to be restored and, and functioning properly is really important. 
So uh, to give a little backstory on Chris, uh, Chris is a veterinarian, and he's a farmer and a stockman as well. He's also a cutting-edge producer of organic crops and livestock, livestock, and he sees playas as a vital recharge wetlands, and he has shifted his practices to protect these playas and the water future of the region. And um, he has been doing this by finding ways to do more dry land farming and to use less water. And he's been doing this by converting much of his cropland back to native grasslands that support cattle. So uh, Chris really attempts to keep his irrigation on his family's farmland in line with the rate of recharge. And he's a major advocate in the area of living within the, uh, the water means of that area. And uh, so Chris, we're really, really glad for you to be here today, and um, I am very excited for you to share with us all the successes that you've had in doing this because you've actually seen some unbelievable results with um, this conversion. So, Chris, can you start by telling us when the work over your land and capture more water began, and was there a line drawn in the sand that triggered this change for you, or tell us a little bit about your your story of how how you got to um, become aware and make changes in your management practices well uh kara first we've our family has uh i had a great uncle that came here in 1927 from germany and then in 1953 my father came from germany and so we've been in this area a long time and so we had a family history in 1927 there was very, very little irrigation here on the Southern Plains. Uh, that was only 10 or 15 years after the first irrigation wells were actually drilled in the region on a limited basis, and you have to think about what the technology they had at the time uh, to employ that. And so our family, uh, we're, we're blessed to have a, a living family history of going from dry land agriculture adapting to fully irrigated agriculture, vegetable production, sugar beets and carrots and potatoes and onions and corn and things like that on on a reasonably large scale. Uh, and now we're, we're taking this path uh, from row crop production. You know, we went from the higher value row crop to, to the lower cost row crop uh, and now moving backwards towards and in, my, in reality, it's forward toward uh, a grass-based uh, farming system that utilizes perennial grasses to uh, protect the soil, increase infiltration rates, uh, use plant genetics that have been there for millions of years, evolved in the region over time, over a very long time, versus uh, imported crops from other parts of the world that weren't as well adapted to our region that we could use irrigation water on to make them work here. Um, and so we're kind of, we're taking it, we're, we're basically uh, following this uh, walk back in history and things that kind of set us up on it. We've been, we had a culture uh, growing up that, that, that there was kind of this doomsday that eventually we're going to run very low in water. We didn't think we'd ever run totally out, but we thought it could, it could run pretty low. And as and as as the well levels declined and the pumping capacities declined, you adapt and you and you keep adapting. Now, fortunately, right prior to uh, the drought of 2011, 12, and 13, the spring of 2010, we decided that we were going to start putting some of our land, uh, particularly areas that were. Uh, corner we we operate we use machines called center pivot sprinklers uh as a predominant form of irrigation is in this area today and um, the corners of those pivots uh you don't irrigate at least in our part of the world if you're up in northern in parts of nebraska they still run uh corner systems but up here in this area the corner system never really caught on uh because the land cost was cheap enough but uh so we started by planting corners in 2010, and then as that's evolved, we've moved to whole fields, and now the majority of our farmland has been has been seeded back to native grasses, 
and allowing them to establish. And so going through the, uh, we were very fortunate because when the drought of 2011 got in full board, it actually started in July of 2010 in our area. But when it got going full bore in 2011 and going on into 2012, of course, we had grass seed out there. We were not about to plow anything up. And we were going to maintain that residue and keep whatever we had to try to get that grass to come up or develop stands. And through that time, what we learned is, A, we saved a lot of money, and B, we had a lot less wind erosion to deal with than we might have had had we had some other uh, types of crops on that land. And uh, so that was kind of the the flashpoint was prior to the drought, but the drought really uh, cemented that mindset of water conservation in our, in, in our family culture. It was already there, but it really pushed it to the forefront. And so, so we kind of went down this road of going toward, uh, soil health principles a little bit backwards. We went we went that way because we were worried about the water table. And it just we we got the benefit of added soil health. Yeah, I think that you had said uh, I think I read somewhere that you had said, well what we thought what we thought started out as a water problem actually turned out to be a soil problem. <laughs> and that makes a lot of sense, right? Because Soil is what holds the water and allows for that, uh, you know, water holding, good soil health allows for uh, water holding capacity that will carry you through those those droughts and, and those times when the rain is minimal, which it always is up there, right? It very much as the, as the, as the, the, the experts in soil health, such as Ray Archuleta, would like to say, it's all interconnected. And I think that's what we've learned. That it is very much interconnected. The 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 aquifer's ability to function, the soil's ability to function, uh, their the uh, soil's ability to hold water. They're all interconnected. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So let's carry this through a little further. You started with your your corners um, of your irrigation fields, and then uh, now I know that you've converted about um, well quite a few acres, at least 7,600 acres, back into perennial grasslands. Um, can you tell us the effect that the this conversion has had on your well levels, I know have been affected, but um, on, on the plyas on your property, or I don't know how many plyas you have, but maybe you could give us a little bit more detail about that information. Well, we have several plyas on our property. If we really analyze our properties that that our family operates we're fortunate that it's all contiguous and and so we're actually in one block and and that makes our data much different than what might be occurring if you have a small property and the neighbor effect on what they're doing on their farmland uh where you have a higher percentage of the land exposed to perimeter uh it's not as you're not going to see the same pure effect because neighbor influence has a much greater Im- impact on the property that being said uh we have um six main plies and we have other a handful of smaller plies along with that on the property and these plier like basins what they are they're the low spot that on our relatively flat landscape, uh, we have, you know, we have very little slope to much much of this land, and these low spots that have that are there uh, actually have a different type of soil on them. They tend to have a, what they call a Randall clay bottom to them, which is a heavy clay, and the reason they work. Uh, the surface is a Randall clay, and then the, right below that is, is this uh, calcareous layer. This uh, it's kind of a cleachy type layer, and that can change. Um, it, we basically have channels that that increase the rate of infiltration of that water, and if those uh, if the soil on the playa lake is functioning properly, 
i.e., we have to have dry cycles here. We need that soil to dry out, to reopen the floor of that basin. And when it does that and the rains then come, uh, there are channels both from plants that are in that basin and the roots of those plants particularly that are in that basin that puncture through that, that clay basin along with the big cracks in the basin. That is what allows naturally the the water to infiltrate rapidly. So what happens? We get a rain, and and whatever water makes it into that ply basin, the, the first water that goes in there, until those cracks are sealed over, that water goes very quickly down in below, below the clay layer. And then that water is then free to continue moving over time. It's a slow process, but it continues to move down over time back toward the water table. That's the traditional thinking on how that works, and we believe that is it's still an accurate model. And um, so... One of the big problems we have with plyas that are non-functional is, is sedimentation, and in some and, and that's a little bit, bit poorly understood because in some soil types sedimentation hasn't hurt the plyas that bad, in other soil types it's it's rendered them non-functional and has has greatly impaired uh, that plyas ability to recharge water in the aquifer, and so. We're fortunate that we have playas that if you drive around our countryside after a heavy rain, there are playas that hold water for months and months, and there are playas that are pretty well gone after two or three weeks. And so we're fortunate in our in, the, in this respect that the majority of our playas are gone rather quickly. They don't hold water for a long period of time. Uh, the water tends to go in well. And so I have to preface that. So there, there, there are thought processes out there. There are people that will say, well, the aquifer doesn't recharge and the, you know, the plyos really aren't that fun, don't have that function. Well, the reality of it, it's a, it's a land spot by land spot basis. So it's a case by case basis, whether an area recharges reasonably well, somewhat or not at all. And the thing we have learned, we have one ply in particular that was farmed, was farmed through, it looked like farmland. When we bought this property, we basically never farmed that low spot again. We have let it go back to become a ply like it originally was. And it, it's in its own natural processes over over about 10 years, it is gaining function on a, on a, on a year-by-year basis of, of, of doing a much better job of doing what it was designed originally to do and so i have a quick question chris um yes. with that particular playa um you said that that happened all naturally there was no rehabilitation um or restoration work done on it it just naturally took care of its functionality what what we did to restore it the only thing we did to restore it was we we seeded native grasslands around that area of that playa and saw tillage on it. That was the only two things that were done. But if you go there today, many of our native plants in the areas around the playa, the native grasses are, 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 are there. Uh, they're not fully there, but the soil biology changes, they're getting more evident. And the the plants such as the smartweed, the, which is a purple top, plant, purple pink top plant that we see out there that the geese and ducks love so well, those plants have come back and taken over that playa basin and some of the native playa, playa grasses have retaken that basin, whether it because the seed was still, the seed bank was still there after many, many years of being farmed through, or whether it was because it was a low spot and that's where the wildlife uh, rehabilitated it for us by moving the seed that they Ate it, somebody else's play it back onto it. That's awesome. That's that's really cool that it just was able to naturally uh, repair itself in that way. So, um, well, let's keep going. Um, so, your playas are in different states. Some some fully functioning, some drain quickly, some drain slow. Um, tell us a little bit about your well levels. 
and what kind okay. of results you've seen there. Over the last 10 years, what, what we have done on this property, and, and granted, you have to realize that in the last 10 years, uh, we've had more, we've had multiple years in the last 10 years. Uh, actually, about four of the last 10 years would be considered truly drought times, okay? And um, during the drought times, we, we do irrigate some crop. We do not irrigate crop to the same intensity that we did prior to 2010, 2011, okay? And, uh, but we still irrigate crops. And what our goal was to see if we could irrigate, if we could, if we could take the data that we knew that was discussed about, you know, from our water district and other water districts across the nation and, and from some hydrology writings out there, and to see what our retired rate really was. And so we took this very conservative stance of saying, okay, let's just guess that we recharge 10% of our annual rainfall. And so we tried to match our pumping level with that over time. And so what we have found is that in years that um, – that we get significant rainfall. So, uh, yes, we have a 20, 22-inch annual average rainfall. That being said, we in 2011, our operation only received three inches of rainfall that year. And we've oh, had dear. other years that we that we received as much as 36 inches of rainfall. And, and so we have, as as the climatic conditions that we farm in, are are not the same as they once were in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, we are now uh, having to take a look at it from a from a little different perspective of how we manage with less water. And by man by pumping less, uh, what we learned is we learned to monitor our well recovery times, and essentially. We are in a county that most years the water table declines at least a foot a year, countywide. And wow. with areas that have four to six foot of decline in a year's time. Now, by, ta- by planting a lot of grass and irrigating less and trying to irrigate to a recharge level, we've essentially, on our Ogallala strata of our water table, we've been able to hold it at a steady rate over 10 years, but during the dry years, we when we're pumping more, we're going down, but we're finding that we're able to recover that during the wetter times, and so our net change is very close to zero over a 10-year period of time when the properties around us continue to decline. And so the thinking was that it was kind of like a big, like a big bathtub of water in that if my neighbor's wells go down, well, then mine must go down. And what we're learning, that's not necessarily the case, that our individual impact on, particularly if you have a reasonable enough land mass or, or think in terms of large recharge fields or large well fields, that we can have impacts by changing our operation and trying to maximize the water going into the soil in the water going and and maximizing the water that goes into the plies that to get it to go into the aquifer. So kind of a thinking of through that process, our our not scientifically proven goal, uh, but in general terms this is pretty much our goal, is that we keep ninety percent of the water that falls on the earth, uh, that ninety percent of that goes into the soil and is stored rapidly at the time of the rainfall event, we know that we cannot capture 100% of it. We know that 10% of that will run at, you know, somewhere in that 10% neighborhood, if we're doing a really good job, will run off to the Playa Lakes. And we hope that we capture 100% of that 10% that goes into the Playas for recharge. And, and, and so that's kind of the way we're looking at it. And so we're very blessed here that we have an aquifer and that takes the water off the surface and away from the wind and and evaporation and puts it down below ground to where it can be utilized on an as basis with the technology of pumps. 
And and the the big problem here is that we've been over culturally and economically our region has overutilized our our skill at pumping the water out. And so we that the, the ultimate problem is we're trying to we're trying to produce more we're trying to produce more crop for the given amount of water there. And a lot of that probably came from the fire mindset that you know if we don't get it someone else will and it's not it doesn't recharge anyway so it's okay the the problem with that is is that it fails to recognize the need of future generations of people in the region many of which might be our family members absolutely yes and I know that you, as you mentioned before, you've been there for a very long time. And I know that you'd like to make that available to your children as well. So so that said, um, I'm curious, Chris, tell us a little bit about the work that you've done to help educate other uh, farmers and ranchers, ranchers in the area um, about your successes. And have you uh, been able to generate a bit of a movement, uh, maybe not just you yourself, but I know there's a lot of other people um, trying to to do work in, in helping recharge the Ogallala. Uh, so can you tell us a little about your journey in that arena? Yes, Kara. Uh, what we have done to this point, we have been, uh, when we started this path, it was a little bit of an odd path of people taking land out of production uh, to go towards grasslands. That uh, that discussion, um, what seemed very obvious to us as part of our solution, uh, A, was not a popular thing to do, And it was so different than the direction many people were going with crop production in our region. Uh, No-till acreages were going up, but the idea of going perennial, putting it back to perennial pastures and looking at native seeds and things like that, that was not a popular option. So as we've gone down the road, it kind of helped differentiate what we were already doing from the norm and it made some people curious some people mad and others it it, it basically brought uh when we started down the path that we didn't think this was going to happen but it's brought quite a lot of different attention to our operation uh on both the local regional and national scale and the thing that we've been able to do we've, we've been able to have uh We've had a group of, uh, of agriculturists from different parts of the United States and different parts of the globe come across through uh, a no-till on the plains tour. We have had uh, groups out here with the Ogallala Commons and that that also helped through uh, the USDA's and NRCS and along with uh, – folks from the High Plains Water District and the work that they do. And so we've been able to have a couple of those kinds of of, uh, meetings. Um, Ogallala Commons likes to have have these fly a field day. And they, of course, when they saw that our water table was going up, they asked if they could come and see and bring a group out and look and and so we've had a couple of those types of events that we've, we've, we've hosted on the farm to discuss how it's working and why it's working and to kind of open people's mind about the, the native ecology and how maybe we can coexist with modern agriculture in a native and native ecology uh, to enhance uh, soil function and water table function uh, long term and try to prevent this area from uh, going back to a 1930s timeline of in that era of the the Great American Dust Bowl, and that's one thing people often forget. people farming here often forget that that um, we are in the in the home of the Dust Bowl, and that agriculture even exists here is quite a miracle 
and a testament to humans' durability and ingenuity. For sure, yeah. Um, so why was, why is turning uh, croplands back into native prairie an unpopular idea? I mean, I have my thoughts that you know it's kind of out of tradition of what is of what has been done there. Um, does it go beyond that in its its lack of popularity, or is it a lot about just you know being uh, wanting to continue on with what's been normal? I, I think what it is, I think it is a, uh, a two-fold approach. One is there is a cultural norm of, uh, of, of how a farm should look. And in each area of the world, uh, the, what people grew up looking at is what they believe a farm should look like, whatever that is. And when you go from a manicured field position into back toward a native grassland, it does not have the, to me it has a much improved aesthetic value, but to many people culturally it doesn't have the same aesthetic value. And part of that is that they have failed to understand or be taught about natural systems or plant evolution and and, and plant health how if you, uh, you know, most farmers know that if you immediately quit tilling the soil, that for the first two or three years, uh, you're going to have a flush of annual plants come. Most farmers would view those as weeds. Uh, we have learned to just view them as plants because they are that's what they are. And those plants provide forage, sometimes highly nutritious forage, for for livestock. And they're just one of the phases, they're one of the steps you go through to go back toward native grasslands. Whether you seed them or let them go on their own, it is a, it's a walk. And so as the soil biology changes um, to, um, to become more fitting for uh, the native grasses to to dominate again uh, by leaving the soil alone and quit beating it up and, and denuding it. Uh, when you do that, uh, that change uh, in, in farming communities, it's like, oh my gosh, so and so must be out of money or whatever. They're not. They've gone a different direction, and 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 sometimes it's just a lack of understanding that some of the best things we do for our soil don't necessarily cost a lot of money, but there are other other costs associated with it. And and so the the cultural training and the understanding of ecology in, in a in a education is farmers, even though I mean some of the best ecologists I know are are, are people in agriculture. But nonetheless there's still a segment of them that it's the way that granddaddy did it, and it's and if granddaddy drives by and sees, sees that it's done differently, then, oh, my gosh, that must be a failure instead of understanding it's just different. It's okay. It's just different. And yeah. that yeah. and that maybe that direction of different might be what the future needs to be because if we're, if we're, if our water tables are constantly declining and we're going to, we're pumping as hard as the neighbor is and the neighbor's, Wells are declining, and our wells are declining. And our soil health is going going south, and their soil health is going south. Then maybe just realizing what's causing it, and looking in the mirror and saying, "Hey, I'm part of the problem." It's 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 not much it's not much dissimilar to um, uh, culturally today. We have people that would love to, you know, I guess for example, red meat is is a very big uh, cultural problem for some people because they believe it is a huge significant contributor to to climate change. And those same people have no problem jumping in a new 737 flying three times across the country in a month. And they don't allocate any, call, any climatological cost of driving vehicles, flying planes, living in buildings, they would like to make it simple and saying, oh, it's just the red meat or it's that milk we're drinking. 
And the reality is it's it's all interconnected. It, it goes back to that thought process. It's all interconnected, and we have to own up to our own uh, mistakes and footprints that we leave. Yes, yes. Well, um, I just was thinking of a quote when you said what you said earlier about, you know, we call them plants and, and some people call them weeds. And it made me remember a um, message that I got on, you know, my tea bag one day. And I just looked it up. And I love this quote, but it says, the difference between a flower and a weed is a judgment, right? <laughs> and so I love that concept so of like, you know, it's just, it's, it's about how we judge things and how we view them and, and kind of staying conscious and, and questioning ourselves, right? Of, of why we think things and why we do things and um, becoming curious about, about those types of things and allowing ourselves to, um, make way, make way for new, new beliefs and new systems that, that can be innovative. So, well, I commend you for taking the, uh, initiative and I hope that there's been some ability to have an impact. I mean, I know that there's a few other people in, in your area who are also going in this direction and, and having success. Um, so I'm happy to hear that. One of the things I wanted to ask about, you know, one of the things that deters people from making these changes is that they know that there can be a loss of profit while while transition is happening. And so um, I, I know that I, I believe that you experienced this, but then in the long term found that you were actually saving money because of not having to draw from your wells as much and, and pay for that irrigation water. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've rationalized balancing ecology with economics? Well, first of all, there's a if when we're when we're viewing the the process of whole farm economics uh, and whole community economics and things like that, when we look at uh, the value of real estate which in a farming operation, if the farm is owned, if the farmland is owned by the operator, which in our case, that is the case. We don't rent any acreage uh, from, it's all family held, okay? And mm -hmm. in our case, um, we have to allocate what, did, what, amount, what was the cost of the water that we pulled out of the ground, what did it cost to pump, and what was the value of the water for ourselves or future generations as we pump it out, what is that really costing our family and costing our community? Uh, because uh, if we don't have – now, in our case, we the, the data strongly, strongly to suggest that – by the changes we've made that recharge is occurring and it's occurring actually quite efficiently. Um, and that, you know, if you, you know, if you look at the timelines that have been suggested for recharge um, being extremely long, it, you know, at the rate, if we would quit pumping and we look at our average incline of water, um, we would be we could be back at a really great status with our water table in in you know less than a hundred years, and mm -hmm. so and that may be very spe area specific. Okay. Well, that's it for this but, episode. Thanks so for listening. What we had additional to information yes, can be found in the notes. Cash and please leave a comment and don't forget to subscribe. In but also appreciate during the transition. You can fill out a brief survey and tell us what you thought of the production. Podcast. It helps There's us a period there before it's really not ready to, to graze or I'm grow host, something Rich else Myers. on. Alan you lose and two or three or four or five years of field at the National Center for Appropriate Technologies headquarters actually, I think, in Butte, Montana. I, I really think it will take longer than that to get it to the full grazing potential. As part of potential. NCAT's ATRA Sustainable However, Agriculture what Program, we have any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations uh, expressed in, the in this recording grassland are those of the participants areas, that do not necessarily reflect the view of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week.
and it's, then, it's a slow process, but it's it's happening. Mm-hmm. And one of the things we've learned is the majority of grasses that we're growing that grow naturally in our region, the vast majority, are warm season perennials. Um, and we have some cool season perennials and some cool season annuals, but the majority are warm season plants. So one of the tools that we that we accidentally incorporated because uh, of a need for making more money because it cost us some to do it, to do this was we started no till planting directly into native grass stands, either 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 established stands or developing stands. And and that's done organically, so that we're not spraying the ground. We may graze the ground before we do it, or right after we do it, or we may run a a mower, a big a big uh, mower across the top of it to mow down to get to make sure there's no standing residues and flat to where it really protects that soil, and we're and it allows us to plow to plant more into a mulch, so we we don't lose any, as much water. And Do you so use a, uh, a flail, a flail mower. Sorry, Chris. No, we don't use a flail mower. We should, but we actually use a uh, a horizontal blade Schulte shredder. Uh, it's a thirty foot shredder. It's it can go. We can go nine or ten miles an hour. We use uh, about a third of the fuel that we would have used had we run a what in the plains are commonly called. There's there there's these. Uh, a real common tool is what they call a, it's a chisel plow that has sweeps on it and runs from one to three inches deep just to undercut the material. And there's variations of that to these great big blade, blade plow type units that we've used before uh, for tillage. And to go away from that, we found that we could, we could shred it down for a third of the cost and do it faster than we could if we were plowing. And so, uh, when we have livestock, when we have enough livestock available, we co- employ the livestock first. If we if if we're green and wet and it's good and we need to get it knocked down first beforehand, we'll 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 run that big shredder. Um, or and when we've even done some deals where we no till first into the into into the plant material and then shredded it off right afterwards, uh, and and have had have had reasonable success in any of those methodologies. The key on that is to is to put those acres in in pasture cropped acres is what the term is. Colin Sites in Australia is credited with uh, coming up with the concept. Um, unfortunately, we tried it and then learned about Colin Sites, so we kind of got the the cart before the uh, before the horse once again. Um, and uh, if we if we do it during our wet cycles. Uh, that's one way we can really make up for some of that loss of income that was made by reducing our irrigation, at least short-term cash flow. So, but we, and we can do that with very little expense because we've just eliminated all of the cost of herbicides and tillage that when we did that. So we've got a little, a little bit of shredding costs or we've got some grazing costs, which then is actually grazing income. And, um, and uh, of course, we still have a fertility cost. We use composted cattle manure or cattle manure out of our local feeding uh, facility. Some of it's aged for a long time before it's ever used. We'll spread that on the on 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 the surface uh, if we're short on 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 nutrients. Um, but um, we basically, it's a very simple process. That we is it always the most beautiful process? No. But what we've learned is we can make comparable yields to what we would have made had we gone back to our more traditional farming practices. And we do it with less cost. So by doing that, we have majorly reduced our labor costs on the operation, and we've majorly reduced our equipment needs on the operation. So we basically, we have some smaller tractors for odds and ends and mowing ditches and things like that. And Moving the occasional bale of hay if we need to move a bale of hay around. We don't. We don't. We no longer produce hay on our operation. We do buy a little bit um, for for the for the livestock uh, when they're in pens or whatever. But other than that, we're we're not doing that. Um, and and so, uh, 
one of our big our big cost savings was the fact that we just don't use as much equipment anymore. So we've gone mm-hmm. from four or five tractors that were in the 200 to 300 horsepower range to one. And we operate our farming operation. I I am, a, as you said, I'm a practicing veterinarian. I have a practice in, in Hereford, Texas. And we stay very, very busy with that. And I... And when I'm not there, I'm out. I'm either with my family here on the farm, working side by side with them, or somewhere else in the farm working. And um, you know, we do this with with uh, a couple of family members that are are school aged, and uh, one full time farm employee who's here running around the farm when I'm at the practice, and making sure the details that I can't get to are attended to, and so. It's a, you know, by by changing to grass based agriculture, we've become a more efficient operation from a just day to day operations perspective, and we've reduced our overall cost of operation significantly. Um, but it hasn't. Um, that that is the the first three or four years of going down that road. That is the hardest thing to do. And to stomach what it's going to do to your lifestyle during that three or four years, that's hard on a lot of people to to understand. And if you're using outside financing on anything you do, that's also something that's very difficult for the financial sector to understand. Now, once they see the well level stabilizing and going up, uh, and and it appears to us that we probably – you know, from a mathematical perspective, we our normal day in day out recharge is somewhere appears to be somewhere between a million two and a million eight gallons a day of just recharge. If so, if we weren't irrigating, that would be roughly the amount of water on a day by day basis. Even if you know, and it it doesn't come day by day; it comes by great big by the big rainfall events. Okay, but if if we can store, if we just say a million and a half gallons a day, well, that that's at 150 gallons a person, that that's a lot of that's that would it's oh I mean, so you can sustain a you can sustain a, a pretty good sized city doing that by just yeah. saving that water that's going on. And so it, it it makes these or at least a mid sized city. It makes a mid sized city that might not be viable viable or it makes a large you know, in our area, we have some really large cattle feed lots, and uh, that are some of which are extremely well managed. And you know, you could, you could, uh, you could. That would be the water requirement, drinking water requirements, about a hundred thousand head of cattle. It's a lot of animals. That if you weren't, so if you give, a, if you to get a greater understanding of the problem on the plains, everyone wants to blame uh, the livestock. And the livestock industry takes a lot of water, no question about it. However, the plants to feed the livestock take significantly more water than the livestock themselves. And if the irrigate, if the model for livestock production is based solely on irrigated agriculture, then the products they produce is ecologically very water inefficient. However, if it's based on a dry land cropping model that is really growing plants that are not viable for human consumption in their normal state, such as the native grasses, then all of a sudden livestock production becomes a very viable water alternative for low water areas or people that are trying to conserve large amounts of water. It becomes extremely sure. viable sources of food. For sure. And so For it's sure. a matter of management. So it's like so many things. It's a matter of management and perspective, both. Yeah. I don't know if I answered so, your question there, but. No, yeah, I think you did a very good job. That was very thorough. Thank you. Um, I am curious about two things. Um, one is when did you go organic? And uh, I know that your your crops are organic. Uh, the, the second is. Well, I guess there's three questions. So when did you go organic? The second one is, were you 
running livestock before you started converting your land? Did you you utilize livestock um, prior to that or was bringing livestock onto into your operation a new thing? And then the third question is, um, do are the livestock um, direct marketed or how do you operate the livestock? Okay. Kara, here's how here is our to answer all three questions. First of all, we moved into organic agriculture. We started the move in the late nineties. So nineteen ninety eight and nineteen ninety nine is when we had the realization that we needed to look at something different. And we started I believe we first started uh selling organic production in about 2001 or 2002. So we've been at this organic game right at 20 years or a little over as far as learning the game and learning the the methodologies and thought processes of organic farming. And um, that was a, a move to be less dependent on 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 chemical agriculture and uh because what people don't realize those agricultural chemicals that people use a we uh there's a lot of variability on one the safety of some of those products and two they cost a lot of money and so when you combine those two and you compare it to the fact that at that time that margins were not really good, it kind of made it made it an obvious move. We should try it. And like so many things, most people will say you should step slowly into something new. Well, we're not real good at trying to do two things at once. So when we started moving and start seeing any sign of success, we move rapidly. And and so, or relatively rapidly, and and so we transitioned our entire operation at one time. Wow! And okay. Instead of trying <laughs> to do a dual system, it was just simpler to operate as a single model system. Of yes, we're gonna we're just gonna be organic on everything, and we're going to adopt those principles and and get certified by USDA certified accreditor, accredited certifier, and and that's what we did. So that was the part. We all at that time and prior to that time, uh, this farm has always had uh, some level of livestock production on it. Only during brief periods of the history of this farm were there no livestock involved in the operation. Okay. So there's always mm-hmm. been some level of of offer of livestock. Now, the way we operate livestock today is significantly different than we did in the past. In the past, uh, the, when it was all tilled land pretty well, except for the playa lakes themselves uh, or the grass areas around the playas, when when that was being done, uh, we ran cattle on wheat pasture and stalks and and crop residues in the wintertime. And then we would essentially be devoid of livestock except for a small cow herd in in the rest during the rest of the year. So we'd run cattle from uh September, October or November all the way through March, April or May. And then June, July and August we wouldn't have any livestock on the place except for a few cows. And now uh our main focus today is we're predominantly a cow calf and stalker operator, stalker operator, i.e. we're keeping our calves and making them bigger. We also run sheep on this operation. And so we have a uh, a ewe flock and and keep those lambs and get those to market ready weight. And uh at the junction we're at right now because of time, not because of desire, but because of time, we have not made the move to direct marketing those animals. That doesn't mean that we have not considered it. We have considered it uh, quite a lot at times and um, just did not make that move yet. So we sell we sell our animals uh, through more traditional channels 
and um and and just strictly it, it just strictly strictly as a function of time more than uh a desire to do something different i think we we've done well enough at the crop farming side even with the grass that i guess we haven't built felt forced to do that yet but that has been our longer term goal as a better way to put it it's still a goal for the operation it's just it's just you you we have to be able to manage it really well and if we're going to put something out there in the market um it has to be right for what the consumer wants that's the way we look at it sure that makes sense that makes sense and um so i'd just like to go back to the organic uh certification again so getting certified in Texas in the late 90s, just, you know, a couple years after you know, organic certification even became a thing, right? So you were a very early adopter, um, and Texas is still very, very behind the curve in terms of percentage of farms that are certified organic. Um, how did you get tuned into that um, at that time? I know that a lot of the certified organic farms that, that do exist in Texas, there's quite a few in the panhandle, right? And whether they're cotton, yes. uh, I know there's a few cotton, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of organic cotton in the panhandle because of the premium on the, uh, you know, the return, um, the return on investment. So I am just wondering, you know, how you got tuned into that at that time and um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your story and if you have any thoughts about, uh, why more people don't go that route, um, or or some of the things, some of the reasons why you see people going organic um, now where they didn't before. Well, fortunately, that that is one of our advantages of being here in Desma County, Texas. Uh, there was a small company uh, that was started here uh, many years ago. This, it, uh, this year is actually no longer in existence. It's been bought and sold and traded, and it had a long history of in the organics. It was earlier, was in the game before, um, before the certification process by USDA was even in place. So there was, a, there was a gentleman here by the name of Frank Ford who I knew when I was growing up. I didn't know Frank well, but I knew Frank well enough. And and Frank was a fighting Texas Aggie, uh, a Texas A&M graduate, and uh, him and a gentleman who was a pioneer in the in the sorghum production in the United States by the name of George Warner. They were friends, and Frank got to selling product to people in the north uh, western part of the United States and started a little company called Arrowhead Mills. And uh-huh. uh, uh, and so that had a local presence, and my family, my father was also at one time involved in a flower mill in California that did some work with them. So we had some idea, we had some understanding of the organic business from that level. We also had a wonderful, wonderful neighbor by the name of Ralph Diller, who was a wonder, who was a wonderful farmer, still a wonderful neighbor, who had been in organics for a long time. He had he had adopted the principles early on. And so I had a front row seat to watch Ralph do his wonderful work in organic agriculture. And learn from him uh some of the things that worked and didn't work work and and adapt to you know adapt some of his thinking into into our farming and how we can make it work because uh there's a lot of ways to do it right. And so we were, so before the certification process was ever in existence, we were already uh, maybe not intentionally learning about organics, but just by observation learning about organics, okay? And and then the time came that it looked like we needed to adopt it on a, on a on, on, look at adopting it, and we made the move to do that. And and yes, us, uh, not unlike other farmers in our region, adopted it uh, as much from a what we thought was right for the culture and the environment 
it was as much uh, adopted from an economics perspective of, hey, we can do we can do both. We can have a better life for our farm and our family, and we can uh, try to to learn to farm in a way that maybe it's better for the earth. And what we learned is that some of the technologies of some of the methodologies in organic agriculture are um, 